Okay, uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks to the organizers for putting together this great conference, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak here. Um, so, the story I want to tell you about uh, begins with uh, something called not contact homology, which is uh, which is a package of knot invariants that are associated to a smooth knot um, inside of uh, free space. Let's just say R3 or S3. And this is something that uh, began in uh, symplectic and contact geometry, uh, but it's sort of spread out in some various ways that I think are sort of interesting. Uh, so it's, it's uh, spread into some bits of knot theory, so there's some interesting relations to uh, representations of the knot group. Um, and there's, it's uh, also gone towards uh, relative loop spaces and uh, string topology, and a, a little bit towards partially wrapped uh, pleuromology. Uh, and uh, maybe, to me, the most interesting thing is that a few years ago we, we discovered that uh, there was some relation to uh, topological strings and some, some work, uh, uh, some, some flavor of mirror symmetry in, in the spirit of Aganagic and Bafa. Um, so those are all things that I want to try to say something about during this mini course. Um, and on this last point, uh, so I think the, so we discovered that there was some relation to topological strings a few years ago, uh, and the physicists since then have sort of sped, zoomed past us and are doing things that uh, on the mathematical side I don't really understand, but uh, on the mathematical side, we've been trying to catch up, and, and now I think we have a little bit of a, a slightly better idea of what's going on from our perspective, and so that's, that's certainly something that I want to aim towards in this. Um, so how much of this is actually absolute truth, I'm not completely sure. Uh, a lot of it is sort of conjectural. Um, okay, so uh, the, the um, setup of this mini course, so today I'm going to start with some introduction and to tell you about uh, co-normal bundles and uh, not contact homology, uh, and then eventually we'll get around to talking about uh, string topology and the fact that the uh, this invariant, uh, some sort of invariant, is a complete invariant of knots in relation to partially wrapped uh, Fleur homology. Uh, that part, I think I will probably, well, it depends on time, but I, I may not spend so much time on this uh, because I want to try to explain a little bit more uh, as far as I understand it. Uh, so, some sort of new things involving augmentation varieties uh, that you get from knot contact homology and relations to topological strings. Um, and uh, something I'll call the Humphrey D module. Relation to recurrence relations for colored Humphrey polynomials. Um, okay, and this is, this is this last bit is going to be pretty speculative, and there will be some some amount of work in progress. There. Okay, so let's see what's the best way to do this. Should I start over here and then move that way? Who's in charge of the camera? Is that you? So, what do you prefer for me? Should I, maybe I should not just keep alternating back and forth. <laughs> okay. So, so here's the, the general setup. Um, so we have a smooth manifold M, uh, and so we can look at its cotangent bundle, uh, and the cotangent bundle is then naturally a symplectic manifold. Uh, so, just to remind you, so that the standard way to see this, so let's call alpha, the, this is the Liouville one form, the topological one form on T star M, which is in coordinates, this is the sum of PI and QI, where the Qs are the coordinates on M, the position coordinates, and the Ps are the dual momentum coordinates. Um, and then the, the symplectic form is, I guess, uh, minus, I'm going to say minus D alpha. Right, so this is the sum of the DQIs wedge the DPIs. Um, okay, so I'm actually going to think of this, so let's draw this, so here is M. I'm actually going to, to try to uh, put a boundary on this, so what I'm going to do is look at the disk part of the cotangent bundle. So this is the disk part of the cotangent bundle, if you put some sort of metric on M. Uh, no, I can't actually. Um, and then the, the boundary of this disk cotangent bundle, which is the 
sphere, uh, the cosphere bundle. This is now a contact manifold. So this is the contact manifold. Uh, I'm not going to, so everything I'm going to say that's on the symplectic and contact side somehow will be a little bit, uh, I'm not going to dwell on the details so much, but uh, so I think most of you know what a contact manifold is, uh, but the, the key thing is that there's this one form on it, which is again just alpha. Okay, so the cotangent bundle is a is an even dimensional manifold. So if m is two n uh, sorry, if m is n dimensional, then the cotangent bundle, of course, is two n dimensional, and then the unit cotangent bundle is two n minus one dimensional. So this is some sort of odd dimensional thing. Um, and uh, from the viewpoint, if you're sitting on the zero section and you look outwards, then then this width, which is the sphere part of the cotangent bundle, maybe that looks far away. So I'm I'm often going to think of uh, the sphere part of the cotangent bundle as being the cotangent bundle at infinity. <coughs> so if I say things at infinity, that's, that's what I mean. So if, here's, here's a, a, a more symplectic geometry picture of the same thing. Uh, so this is the disk cotangent bundle. So this, this thing right here is symplectic, and then its boundary is the unit sphere bundle. Um, and then this, this fits into some sort of nice picture where, where uh, this is a symplectic manifold. Uh, and this is its convex contact boundary, uh, so very rapidly. So this is, there's some sort of uh, vector field on here that expands the, uh, the symplectic form uh, uniformly. It's, it's uh, transverse to the boundary, and the boundary, that Liouville vector field and the symplectic form on here uh, determine a one form, and that one form is the contact form. Um, anyway, so this, this is just a picture of a symplectic manifold with boundary. Um, okay. So uh, now I want to introduce a knot into the picture, and I guess since I have um, multiple colors, maybe I will. Uh, actually, it's probably best to stick to back. So let's suppose that we have a knot uh, k sitting inside of M. This actually, for now, this can be any sort of submanifold. Um, it's just a smooth submanifold. And out of this, then we can uh, produce the conormal bundle. Uh, which I'll write as L sub k. Uh, so L sub k is just the set of points in the cotangent bundle uh, that, so that the position is over the knot k and the uh, momentum annihilates the tangent space to k as p. So p is in, uh, sorry, q. q is in k and uh, let's write it like this, p, t, q, k. Okay. Um, great. So topologically, this is you know we have a choice of a metric on our manifold. So this this topologically, it's the, it's diffeomorphic to the normal bundle, uh, if that's more uh, familiar. But this thing is sort of a nice nice thing to include in the picture. So. So here is k sitting inside of M, and lying over k, we now have this. Oh, it can also be a link. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good point. In fact, I, I yeah, not a word link. Uh, thank you. Um, I think mostly I'll be talking about the not case, but I'll say things about the link case once in a while because it'll be important later on. Um, okay, so uh, k is a submanifold inside of M, and lying over it. There is this conormal bundle, LK. Uh, and the important feature of LK uh, from the point of view of symplectic geometry is that this is a Lagrangian submanifold. <coughs> this is inside of uh, T M. And it's Lagrangian, and that means that if you take the uh, <laughs> if you take the uh, symplectic form uh, and restrict it to this, you get zero, and it's maximal dimension, dimensional for that to happen, so it's half the dimension of the entire symplectic manifold. Like this. Um, and where it intersects the uh, sphere part of the bundle, uh, I'm going to give that a name as well. Uh, this will be called lambda k. So lambda k is lk intersecting with the sphere. 
a bundle, the cosphere bundle, and this is uh, now uh, a subset of, of a contact manifold. This is a contact manifold, and the subset is what's called Legendre. Uh, and what Legendre means is this is just the odd dimensional analog of Lagrangian, so uh, the contact one form, when you restrict it to lambda k, is identically zero, and it's again sort of maximal dimensional for this to happen. So this is this is very easy to check from the definition that, that this is true. Okay. Um, great. So I will attempt to draw this picture over here as well. So uh, here, maybe sitting inside of the disk part of the cotangent bundle is the manifolds, the zero section M, uh, and. Then we have, this is a slightly weird looking picture, but uh, something that looks like this, LK. So LK intersects M in K, and this is lambda K up top. Um, so this is the picture that I'm actually going to use uh, mostly during this uh, mini course, but somehow geometrically it doesn't look right. This, this looks sort of more, uh, more like what your intuition would say, so just wanted to put these both in here. Um, okay, so uh, so what is the picture we have? Uh, uh, you have this is the, uh, some sort of contact manifold. Uh, this symplectic manifold is what's called an exact symplectic filling of this uh, contact manifold. So it's a symplectic manifold. It's exact because the uh, symplectic form is exact and has some sort of nice behavior with respect to the boundary. Uh, and then uh, we have this uh, nice Lagrangian inside of this uh, exact symplectic manifold. And where it intersects the zero section is the, the knot or link k. And where it intersects the boundary is this Legendrian uh, submanifold lambda k. Um, and just, just for uh, dimension count. So if dim the dimension of m is n, then uh, the dimension of lambda k is n minus 1. Uh, it's just under half the dimension. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so the, the observation, and this is some sort of version of, of uh, something that's been known for a long time, you know, back to or not at least. So if, uh, if k changes by smooth isotopy, So if we, if we just move k around inside of m by smooth isotopy, then that moves lambda k inside of this contact manifold by what's called Legendrian isotopy. So lambda k sitting inside of this thing uh, changes Legendrian isotopy. And this is isotopy through uh, Legendrian submanifolds. Is it simply the lifting of the smooth? Smooth maps. That is exactly just the lifting of this smooth uh, isotope. Yes. Okay. So there's, there's, this is uh, a fairly content-free statement in some sense. There's nothing really going on here. Um, but the, the question, uh, so one question that I'm going to get to at some point uh, is, so you could ask, okay, so what does the Legendrian isotopy type of lambda k remember about the smooth isotopy type of k? So what does uh, what does this remember about the submanifolds uh, not a link, say, K sitting inside of um, So this, this for a while was a motivating question uh, in the subject, and at least in the case of knots inside of uh, R3, we now have a, a full answer to this. So that's something that I'll get to um, later on. Uh, okay. So now I'm going to march over to there. Oops. Okay, so. <laughs> Okay, so we 
we're going to, wait, now we've migrated over here. So we're going to uh, specialize to a particular case. Uh, and this will be the case where M is R3 and the DK is another link in R3. Uh, if you don't like R3, you can think about S3. In fact, at some point, I think I'm just going to replace R3 by S3 without comment. Uh, but uh, for some technical reason at the beginning, it's, it's actually better to, to work with R3. Um, okay. So in this case, uh, the unit cotangent bundle of R3, this is topologically, uh, what is it? It's R3 cross S2, right? It's a trivial bundle. Uh, and this is also, so this is a contact manifold. This, is, this can also be written as a contact manifold in the following way. So I write as J1 S2. Um, so where J1 of some manifolds, I've already used M, so let's call it N. Uh, this is the one jet space of N, so this is T star N crossed with R. Um, and this is, a, this is naturally a contact manifold for any N. Uh, is the one jet space uh, is contact uh, with the contact form Uh, so in these, uh, so let me put coordinate z on this r factor, and the contact form on, on this space here will be dz minus the Liouville form on t star m, uh, not restricted to alpha on t star m. Okay. Um, and then it's a, it's a fairly easy exercise to, to check that well, by equals, what I mean is that these two things are actually contactomorphic. Uh, the same, these are the same contact manifolds. There's a sort of obvious, uh, well, there's a, there's a diffeomorphism between these two spaces that sends the contact form, one form here to the contact one form over there. Um, Okay, so that's that's the contact manifold that uh, lambda k lives in, and then uh, what is lambda k? So let's first think about L k. So if, uh, let's say that k has uh, R components. Um, k1 through kr. Um, so what does LK look like? So LK is the co-normal to, to this multi-component, possibly multi-component uh, link. And it's now the disjoint union of the co-normals to each of the link components individually. Um, uh, so LKI, so this is the co-normal to uh, KI. Uh, and again, so the co-normal is diffeomorphic, at least just to the normal bundle of Ki. Uh, so this is uh, just for topological purposes. Uh, let me just note that this is the same thing as the normal bundle of Ki. So we have, uh, let's see, here is Ki. Co normal looks something like <coughs> this. So this is LKI. Uh, it just looks like a solid torus. Uh, so it's it's S1 cross D2. Uh, so this is a solid torus. And uh, this is a solid torus. Uh, and then lambda KI is the boundary of this tubular neighborhood. So the normal bundle, of course, is the same, uh, diffeomorphic to just the tubular neighborhood of Ki, which is the way that I've drawn it here. Um, and then lambda Ki is, it looks like the boundary of a tubular neighborhood of Ki. Um, and this is just, uh, so this is a two doors. So the boundary of this lambda Ki. Um, so what this means is that lambda k, so lk is a disjoint union of r solids tori, 
And lambda decay is a disjoint union of R two pi. This is a disjoint union of R two pi. I don't know how to write this. <laughs> Um, okay, let's go back over here. Are those four, they can be some tall or intersected like? Uh, they can be, well... They can follow up. Um, they can form... So they do form a link, but that link is unknotted inside of this five-dimensional manifold. In fact, maybe I'll say something about that in a second. But yeah, the, the picture is that these are two-dimensional sub-manifolds inside of a five-dimensional space, and somehow there's enough degrees of freedom that you can just unlink them. Yeah. Sorry. Back. So for now, I'm going to, so the, the, my main focus is going to be to focus on the case of R equals 1, where K is a number. So R is the number of components of K. Um, so in this case, uh, lambda K is, is uh, right, so this is a two torus sitting inside of R3 plus S2. Um, and even in this case, even without the presence of other components, there's something interesting to ask. So what does the topological type of this uh, remember about k inside of R3 cross S2, and the answer is nothing. So um, topologically, smoothly, uh, all lambda k's are isotopic um, for, uh, for all knots k. Um, and this is, this is uh, fairly easy to check. Uh, so the thing to, to think is, if you have two different knots, well, they're not smoothly isotopic to each other necessarily, but you can certainly homotop one to the other, right? There will just be moments when the knot passes through itself. And what that gives you is that gives you a, a homotopy between uh, the conormals for the two different knots. Uh, and then because you have two homotopic uh, two-dimensional things inside of a five-dimensional thing, uh, you, can, uh, you can perturb it so it actually becomes an isotopy. Any, any knots K1 and K2 are homotopic. Uh, and that tells you that lambda K1 and lambda K2 are homotopic uh, two tori in this five dimensional space. Uh, and it's, as soon as they're homotopic, then just by dimension counting, they have to be isotopic. I don't know if dimension counting is the right thing to say. There's, there's enough uh, freedom you can just move them around each other. Um, okay. Uh, Uh, so, uh, I don't understand dimensional counting. Uh, you don't understand dimensional counting. Yeah, yeah, since it's, it's a non parent of family, it, it should be intercept. Yeah, it's kind of stable. Uh, it's linking dimension. Sorry? In, the, in the linking dimension, as we say, 2 plus 2 plus 1 is fine. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, so it's not really a dimensional counting doesn't show it. Uh, no, no, that's correct. So it does intersect itself at some point, but then you can push off the. Uh, Locally, it cannot. Yeah, what's going on? Um, you're correct, now I'm confused. Uh, so uh, certainly you can actually uh, model this locally and see exactly what happens when the knot passes through itself, and then you can just sort of by hand construct a, a perturbation so that it doesn't intersect. Uh, maybe uh, that's not the best answer. <laughs> so you're, you're correct, maybe it's not by dimension counting. I usually try to omit this fact and nobody points it out. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, you're, you're correct. So, so there's, there, there is an argument along these lines, but it maybe has, is a little bit more than I'm saying here. So, I mean, it's basically if you change your crossing in the knot, then you can do a smooth push-off in the tangent direction. 
to pass through without second transaction. Yeah. yeah, so if you have a crossing of the knot, that, that gives you two double points, ah, but if you double points with opposites, yeah, that's okay, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm just changing this in my notes so I don't lie as much. Okay. So, um, uh, all right. So this, topologically speaking, or as a smooth uh, torus, this doesn't remember anything about the underlying knot. Uh, but of course, uh, we know that it's more than just a smooth torus. It's a Legendrian torus inside of this context, uh, uh, with respect to this contact structure on this five manifold. Um, so. There is uh, now a result. Oh, oh, yes. You can make, uh, make antipodal evolution of those here on this contact. You can indeed. And, and then the circuit will kind of break down. Yeah, I can model out by antipodal evolution. So you, what do you want to do? You want to mod out by, by, by antipodal evolution? Your your yeah. of the Projectivization. You can projectivize. I think it's still the case that you can push things off. It's it's not progressing. Two points, you get one point. Yes. Uh, I think we need some kind of maybe snail. Possibly. Yeah. 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 yeah, sorry, I'm not sufficiently awake to yeah. <laughs> the answer. Uh, okay, so um, there is, however, there's a result of. Uh, it was first shown by Rebecca Chende, uh, and then uh, reproven by Tobias Eckholm and myself and Vivek, uh, which says that uh, if you have two different knots, K1 and K2, and they, then their co-normals, their unit co-normals, are actually uh, Legendrian isotopic, so isotopic through Legendrian submanifolds, uh, then K1 and K2 are smoothly isotopic at R3. Um, so uh, topologically, the, the uh, co-normal doesn't remember anything about the knots, but uh, once you put in the contact information, then it actually remembers everything. Um, so this, this is something that I will talk about a little bit tomorrow. Um, So in the case when R was greater than one, that thing topologically is still to determine for anything? It is still trivial, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so my claim, which I think <laughs> is true, is that uh, so locally you can you can model a crossing change and it, it, when you do a crossing change of K, then uh, that actually you, you can perturb that so it, it becomes uh, a smooth isotopy of, of the co-normals. <laughs> And so you can do this whether the crossing change is between uh, the same component or different components. And what this tells you is you have multiple components and you can unknot the whole thing, unlink the whole thing, so you just get an unlink. Any questions? Okay. So uh, the strategy that, I, that is going to be used to prove this theorem and what's going to sort of underlie the rest of what we're doing uh, is to uh, use uh, holomorphic curve invariance or the disk invariance uh, associated to uh, lambda k uh, to study uh, well the smooth isotopy type of k or the Legendrian isotopy type of lambda k. Um, okay. And what we'll see is that, uh, uh, so I'm going to give you a, a particular package of holomorphic curve invariance, and uh, we'll see that it's related to, uh, as I mentioned before, to uh, path spaces and, uh, and string topology, uh, but also there's, there's some sort of variety that's associated to it called the augmentation variety, and that's what will be related to topological strings and uh, Hopefully, polynomials via some sort of Grimov Wooden potential argument. Um, okay. okay. Um, 
So the holomorphic in invariance that I want to uh, associate to this, this goes by the name in general of Legendrian contact homology. So I'm going to say a little bit about this uh, first, because this is going to underlie everything that we do. Um, I'll attribute this to uh, Eli Ashberg and Hofer. Uh, but in, in this context, it's some, some, somehow the first order piece of uh, some, some sort of symplectic field theory associated to Legendrian submanifolds. Uh, so it's the first order, uh, sort of first non trivial piece uh, of uh, symplectic, <coughs> some sort of symplectic field theory, uh, relative symplectic field theory, uh, because we have this Legendrian boundary, the relative. Uh, and symplectic field theory is some, some big program uh, of Eli Ashberg, uh, given to Alan Hofer. Um, okay, and uh, uh, let me, I'll step back from the, the particular setting that we're doing right now and talk a little bit more generally. So the general setting is we have a Legendrian submanifold inside of a contact manifold. Say so we have a contact manifold with a contact form uh, alpha. So again, the, the, uh, I guess I never said this specifically, but a Legendrian submanifold is one where uh, alpha vanishes along the lambda, and lambda is uh, just under half the dimension of v. Uh, so it's the largest possible thing that is, can be an integral submanifold. This contact manifold which has to be is not compact, yeah. This contact manifold does not have to be compact. Yeah, because it's very geometry and the boundary is big. Trouble, yeah. That is correct. It is, it is similar trouble in both junctures of under and density of under or any complex structure. Oh, uh, there are there are serious problems. In fact, I'm going to restrict this to a particular case, which is the case of one depth bundles. And there, there the problems have been worked out. Yeah. But you're completely correct that in, in general there's like significant problems in defining this because of exactly these sorts of issues. Um, so. In certain circumstances, then out of this picture, we're going to get. And so, out of this picture, we're going to get a differential graded algebra, which I'll call the Legendrian uh, DGA. So, this is differential graded algebra. Um, and I'll write this as a script A and the differential B. Uh, and uh, then the homology of the, so to, to this setup where we're going to associate a differential graded algebra and the homology of this differential graded algebra is what's called the Legendrian contact homology of lambda. This is Legendrian contact homology. And under certain nice circumstances that I'll describe, then uh, this thing is an invariant of the Legendrian under Isotopic. Is it the same what some people call Chicano algebra? Uh, yes, this is the Chicano. Yeah, <coughs> to, Yasha once berated me for calling it this and not putting in Chicano. So this is the Chicano of Eli Ashberg. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that's enough names. Differential graded on the So the big picture somehow, uh, because I have erased it, just, just to keep it in, in your mind, is that but we, in our setting, we have a symplectic manifold with contact boundary. So the contact boundary is sort of the boundary at infinity. And we're looking at this co-normal bundle to a knot, but we're looking at the part of the co-normal that's at infinity. So this is this Legendrian co-normal. Um, and trying to extract some sort of invariance of it out there. Uh, and uh, later on, we're going to see what happens, how, how that relates to what's inside the symplectic manifold. But, uh, for now, I'm going to remain on the boundary of this thing. Um, so, uh, okay, so let me say something about how this uh, chicano Ashberg <coughs> DGA is defined. Um, so we, we are starting with the contact manifold with a contact one form. Uh, so this 
Uh, out of this, you can construct a, a, a vector field that really uh, uh, somehow controls the dynamics of V, and this is called the rate vector field, uh, which I'll write as R alpha. Uh, and this is uniquely determined by uh, this particular contact one form, so uh, R alpha contracted with V alpha is zero, and then there's some uh, normalization uh, where alpha of R alpha is one. Okay, so this, this is some vector field that's associated to the contact manifold. Um, and uh, so then uh, if, if we have a Legendre, and so here's lambda sitting inside of me, uh, we can look at what are called rate chords of lambda. So these are flows of the rate vector field that begin and end on lambda. Uh, so a rate chord. Lambda is just a flow of R alpha beginning and ending on lambda. Um, this is some sort of relative version. There's, there's also something called, just called contact homology that doesn't have a Legendre. And then these, these are uh, then generated by rape, certain uh, closed rape orbits. So flows that actually begin and end at the same point. Uh, but and now we have something for them to begin and end on. This is this Legendre, and so there's this notion of a rate court. Um, and uh, so now I want to tell you something about this differential graded algebra, and the easy part is the algebra. So the algebra is the, uh, let's see, this is going to look a little bit strange until I define differential, but it's a tensor algebra over a particular coefficient ring which is the group ring of relative H2 of V relative to lambda. So V is the contact manifold, lambda is the boundary <laughs> sub-manifold, uh, generated by rate chords. Uh, and I'm going to denote these rate chords just formally by, by variables, so I'll write them as A1, a2, et cetera. And in, in my circumstance, there are actually going to be finitely many of them. Uh, okay. Maybe I should say that. Uh, so there are, there are versions of this when there are <coughs> uh, countably finite, infinitely many, and there's also some sort of version when, when there are entire families of rape chords, but I, I'm not going to get into that. I'll just do this sort of uh, very transverse case. Um, okay. uh, yes, so this is just an algebra right now, and uh, the grading I'm not going to tell you anything about. Uh, well, the, the grading, it's given by kindly Zander indices of these rate chords, uh, but I will tell you something about the differential, so that's, that's coming next. So the coefficients will be this thing here, that's right. Yeah. And that, that will somehow be important. So, uh, in Chekhanov's original, uh, formulation for this DGA that this was Z mod 2, and that, that is like really not sufficient for us. So uh, I'm going to use these coefficients pretty heavily. Um, So to define the differential, I want to uh, look at holomorphic disks <coughs> in a particular symplectic manifold. Now, V is not a symplectic manifold, but we can make one out of it uh, by, by just crossing it with R. So this is known as symplectization. So symplectization, uh, which I'll write as R cross V. Uh, so uh, the, the symplectic form on here, so the symplectic form uh, omega is d of r to the, oops, e to the t alpha, where t is the coordinate on the r direction. Um, and then with respect to the symplectic form, uh, inside of this uh, thing here, we have uh, this cylinder over lambda, uh, so r cross lambda, is sitting inside of R cross V is uh, it's just a Lagrangian cylinder. It's more or less obvious from, from the definition. Um, 
And, I, and on the simplectization, I need to choose an, a nice, almost complex structure. So uh, I'm going to pass over, there, there are various nice features it needs to have. I'm just going to give you the basic. Uh, so choose an, choose an almost structure. An almost structure J on R cross V. Uh, it, it certainly needs to have a particular uh, particular uh, properties. So one of them is that uh, J is supposed to send, which way does it go? Um, so J is supposed to send the vertical direction, the D by DT direction, to the ray vector fields uh, on V. Um, and uh, J should, should map the kernel, which I have not given a name to, uh, kernel of alpha, which is, this is, this is, the actual contact structure is not given by alpha, but it's given by the hyperplane <coughs> distribution given by its kernel. And this should map the kernel of alpha back to itself. Um, so both of these, the, the rate vector field is, is uh, transverse to the, to the contact structure. Um, so it's supposed to satisfy this, and uh, it's an almost complex structure, so that means that J sends this to minus that. Um, and it should be uh, translation invariant. Um, so it should look the same no matter where you go up and down. Uh, and again, there, there are some additional technical uh, conditions that I don't want to give here. Um, no, you can choose such a thing, and then uh, you can look at uh, holomorphic, uh, so J holomorphic uh, curves sitting inside of the symplectization. And there's, there's a particular one, so this tells you that um, a strip, so a strip uh, R across one of the uh, rig uh, chords is uh, is J homomorphic R. Oops. So here's the picture. The picture is um, somehow everything is expanding. So here's the here's the T direction. Uh, here's the v direction. This is r cross v. R cross v. Um, and then sitting inside of this, inside of v, there is this Legendrian lambda, and there's a Lagrangian cylinder over this. And then if you take a oops, a rib cord for lambda, and just look at r cross with that. So this is now a, a, just a trivial strip in this symplectic manifold, and because of that uh, condition that J sends the d by dt direction to the rate vector field, uh, this is clearly homomorphic. So if, so if you want to remember what the domain is, you can think of it as this is a uh, disk uh, with two uh, punctures on the boundary that gets mapped into here, so that this puncture gets mapped to AI at plus infinity in the R direction, and this one gets maps to AI in the in negative infinity. Uh, I'll just put AI with, whoops, minus here, and this is going to map to AI, but at plus infinity. So you get something that looks like this. Okay, so it's J-holomorphic in the sense that it's, you know, it's the usual sense, right? So there's the standard complex structure over here, and, it, and this map intertwines those two. Um, so, what the differential? So, what, this is all in aid of trying to tell you what the differential is on this DG algebra, and the differential counts uh, particular homo holomorphic disks that look like this, but uh, more interesting. So, D counts. Um, I'm going to say rigid. I'll explain what rigid means in a second. So, holomorphic disks uh, in the symplectization. 
uh, with boundary and R cross lambda uh, of a particular form. Um, I did not say where the grading came from. So they, yeah, I muttered something. I said that the grading is given by the kindly tender index. So there's some integer, or possibly it, it's an element of z mod something that you can associate to each of these things. But I think I'm just not going to say anything about it. Um, okay, so the, the differential counts rigid, rigid holomorphic disks of a particular form. So I'm going to draw them like I drew this here. So it's. Um, Um, so let's suppose that we have uh, uh, a number of rate ports, which I'll write schematic symbolically as AI and then AJ1 through AJK, and these are rate ports of lambda, just any old rate ports of lambda, and K is at least zero. So there might be just AI and nothing else. And what I'm going to do is I'll define uh, a moduli space that I'll write like this. AI, that's a semicolon, AJ1 through AJK. And this is going to be the moduli space of J homomorphic uh, disks. <laughs> so mappings, I don't need the word disk, I guess. Uh, so the mappings are called delta, and this goes from the two disk minus uh, some number of boundary punctures, which I'll write as P plus P1 minus through PK minus. These are boundary punctures. I'll draw a picture in a second. Uh, relative to its boundary, and it's going to map this to uh, R cross V, R cross lambda. Um, and then there will be some more stuff in here in a second. So let's start drawing. This is lambda. This is R plus lambda. Uh, and so here's my disk. Uh, I went slightly further over to the left. D2, it's going to have some number of boundary punctures, which I will just take out. So this is P plus, P1 minus, through PK minus. And K is at, at least zero, so there could be none of these things down at the bottom. Um, and what I want to map to is I want to map this into this picture. But I want to map it in a particular way. So what's going to happen is that the boundary of D2 will map to this Lagrangian cylinder, R cross lambda. So the punctures, a neighborhood of the punctures will map to neighborhoods of uh, hol trivial holomorphic strips at uh, either of the two ends. So uh, I think it's somehow it's easier to draw. Instead of drawing uh, what its image is in here, I'll actually pull it out. So it looks something like this. Um. And this is going to map to so this is a, this is a, it's supposed to be what look, what the neighborhood around P plus looks like, uh, and it's uh, asymptotic to A i at plus infinity, and then uh, down here we have A j one through A j k down at minus infinity. Um, so if I attempted to draw this picture in here, it would look something like this. This may be a bad idea. This sits inside of there. So if, if I were to say this out in words, so this, this is not going to be the world's most precise definition, but uh, so this is asymptotic uh, to AI at plus infinity near P plus, and asymptotic to AJL at minus infinity near PL minus. Small question, it's 
a very unpleasant to draw many things in small pieces and bump in big pieces. Ah, yes. If, if you go upside down, that, does that make sense? Or? Uh, uh, it's actually important that I have one thing up at the top and many things down yeah, at the bottom. Change boundary condition will make sense or not? Uh, it will make sense, but the the differential will it will no longer square to zero. Um, yeah, there, there's a fundamental asymmetry between these two sides, which maybe I'll say something about in a second. But it's essentially that there there can be a holomorphic disk with no negative ends, uh, but there cannot be ones with no positive ends. Uh, and so, if we want sort of the smallest possible complex to be made out of this, we the smallest possible thing is you restrict to just having one positive end, but then you have to allow for arbitrary and negative. Uh, yes. Um, so you said you fix all those complex structures so that, for example, these things are vertical and cylinders and strips are all marked. So do you always, always try to pick all those complex structures within that class? Uh, yes. And why is that so crucial? Uh, well, so, so we certainly need these <coughs> these trivial strips to be holomorphic. Um, you're asking why? Yeah. Uh, so the, the an analogy is with uh, Morse homology. So this is supposed to be like a trivial gradient uh, flow from a critical point to itself, and then we have things that are asymptotic to it. Uh, I think there are ways to perturb this, but this, yeah, this is the setup that I'm on now. Okay. Um, so then. With this in mind, uh, now move over to the other boards and tell you what the differential is. Um, so the definition of D from A to itself. Uh, okay, so I just erased it, but A is some sort of tensor algebra over some coefficient ring. So on the coefficient ring, it, the differential will just be zero. And uh, otherwise, a generator of this, this algebra will look like some product, formal product of rate chords. Um, and so what I'm going to tell you is how to find the differential of one particular red chord, and then it extends by the Leibniz rule. Um, so uh, let's say that AI is a red chord. So the differential of AI, <coughs> I'm supposed to get some other element inside of this algebra, and it is going to be the following thing. So it's the sum over all possible moduli spaces of that form, or pieces of this moduli space, where the dimension Um, well, I want to say that the, I, I want to look at rigid moduli spaces, but there's uh, an annoying uh, translation action. So if I have a holomorphic disk, I can always translate it up and down in the R direction because of this R invariance. And so uh, there's an R action on this moduli space, uh, and what I want is to quotient out by the R action and get a zero dimensional moduli space out of it. Um, By the way, the choices of uh, rate chords so that this happens, this, this is some sort of, in, there's an index formula that tells you exactly when this happens. Uh, and it will actually correspond to the fact that D has degree minus one. Uh, so now I'm going to sum over all holomorphic disks inside of this quotiented moduli space. Um, and to this thing, there will be some sort of sign that I do not want to talk about, uh, but there's, there's, you have to assign orientations to all the moduli spaces, and then there's some sort of nice sign out of this. Um, and uh, actually, maybe I should have started with the other end. So what this disk is going to contribute is to the differential of AI, it will contribute the, the formal product AJ1 through AJK. This is the product of, of rib chords. So it's just to the differential of the thing at the top is just the product of the things <coughs> on the bottom. Uh, and I also want to keep track of the homology class of, of delta. This is where that annoying uh, uh, coefficient ring comes from. So this is, I'll write it as e to the delta. The e, the e is just to turn addition into multiplication. Uh, and delta is the class of this inside of relative h2 of 
So delta, delta it sits inside of r cross v with boundary and r cross lambda. There are also little pieces of the boundary that go to the rib chords, but uh, most of it is on r cross v with boundary and r cross lambda, so project away the r, you get a class in relative h2, uh, v relative to lambda. So I have to say something. Um, so it's u2 after tapping off the uh, rib chords. So the, the boundary is not completely on lambda because there are these rib chords, but they, you can uh, fix uh, what are called capping half disks of those rib chords, and then you actually get something uh, like this. Um, uh, great. Uh, The area with respect to the symplectic form, uh, this thing is infinite, but you can also look at the area with respect to d of alpha. And that's, so for instance, if you do that for this whole <coughs> script, you get zero. And that's, that's maybe a, a better thing to, to look at. The, that is correct, yes. So, um, yes. So if you look at the area of this holomorphic uh, disk with respect to d alpha, then the area is just this the difference between the, the length of this red cord and the sum of the lengths of those. And so if all the red cords have positive length, then there's some sort of finiteness in it. Um, Say what I said up above. So to extend to all of A by the Leibniz rule. Ah, so since length of A pi is bigger than the length of A to the That's correct, yes. Yeah, I should say this. So it's Stokes, there's some results that come from Stokes' theorem uh, that says that uh, the length, I think of this as a height uh, length, well, let's say that. For, the, for this uh, moduli space to exist at all, this has to be strictly bigger than the sum of the lengths of A, J, L. Oh, to be non empty, yes. Yeah. So there's some sort of action filtration on this algebra, and this decreases the action filtration. Um, okay. So I am running out of time. So I. Uh, let me state uh, the, the main result about this. So this is a theorem which in this context is work of Eckholm, Nettleg, and Sullivan. Uh, and this builds on uh, work of Elias Ashberg, Hofer, and Chekhov. Um, and this says, uh, so assume uh, V is not just any old contact manifold, but this is where I have to make some sort of assumption on it, and I'm going to assume that it's a one-jet space. Uh, and uh, then there's, I'm going to say some weasel word. So every, everything is suitably generic. Um, so then, uh, three things. So one is that D decreases degree by one. <coughs> this is a content-free statement since I didn't tell you how to define degree. Uh, but, but, <laughs> but yeah, this dimension is the, the difference between the degree of AI and the sum of the degrees of AJ1 through AJK. Uh, again, I don't want to get into this, so let's let slide. Uh, the second thing is that D squared equals zero. Um, and the third thing is that the uh, homology of this differential graded algebra is an invariant is invariant under the John Reed So this is what I was calling LCH. So if lambda is invariant under the John Reed
Um, do I have like a couple more minutes? Three. Three? three I have three more minutes. Okay. Uh, so we're going to, the next time we will associate this to the particular case that I gave you of a, the conormal to a knot. Uh, but maybe let me try to draw some picture of why d squared is equal to zero, because this is going to be important uh, later on down the road. And that will be where we'll stop. So this is some sort of um, Fleur homology, Fleur type homology. So the, the proof that d squared equals zero is sort of along the lines of all of these uh, proofs that d squared equals zero in Fleur homologies. Uh, but there's, there's some sort of a weird thing right here. So um, the usual proof is instead of looking at zero dimensional moduli spaces, you look at one dimensional moduli spaces and then look at how, how the boundary breaks. Um, so d squared equals zero. Um, look at boundary <coughs> of one dimensional moduli spaces of the same form. Um, so maybe here is a one dimensional moduli space that uh, begins at AJ. Let's suppose that it has one positive end and one negative end. So the usual Fleur theoretic, if you think of this as like a gradient flow, a uh, generalized gradient flow, the usual Fleur theoretic thing would say you can, uh, this can break into two things. Again, it begins at AI, it ends at AJ, and there's something in between. Uh, but there's this annoying thing that, uh, unlike in Morse homology, this, this can degenerate in other ways. So for instance, here's a way it could degenerate. So AI. And what this thing here is, this is, this is a holomorphic disk with just a positive end and no negative end. So you're supposed to imagine this is two copies of, this is R cross V, and this is also R cross V. This is what's called a two-story building. Um, and it can degenerate this way, but it can also degenerate some way like that. Uh, so that's why you have to incorporate uh, possibly many uh, negative ends and not just one. Um, and why is it that you can just restrict to having one positive end? Well, so once, once uh, you sort of give up and decide that you have to allow for many negative ends, so here's a one-dimensional moduli space then that we want to degenerate. Uh, and so this could degenerate into something that looks like maybe like this. Um, and this is exactly counted in the differential. So the differential of this thing uh, would include these two things, and then the differential, the product of those would give you those three. So that is included in the differential. The thing that you have to worry about uh, for d squared equals zero is that there could be some other terrible degeneration. So this is a degeneration into a two-story building, um, but there's also a possible degeneration that you could imagine that somehow is a boundary degeneration like this, where maybe these two points come together and, and uh, it's split off, so you now have two holomorphic disks. But the good thing is this cannot happen. So this, this can't happen because this doesn't occur by Stokes' theorem. So if there is a boundary de degeneration, each of the individual pieces would have to have a piece at plus infinity, but there's only one piece at plus infinity. Uh, so that just can't happen. Um, OK, we'll, we'll see some cases where, where uh, things break down if you uh, try to generalize this. Uh, either next time or the time after. So I am over, so that's okay. probably a good answer. It rules out plane bubbling. It also rules out the existence, well, it's the same thing, right? It rules out uh, closed ray orbits. Um, right. That's right. Other questions? So how much is understood about the case where you do allow multiple uh, punctures up top? Ah. Or are you going to talk about that next? Uh, I will talk a little bit about that. The answer is it's somewhat understood in, in certain cases. So this is what's called relative symplectic field theory. So for Legendre, one dimensional Legendre knots inside of R3, I have some sort of version of this uh, uh, that involves string topology. And there's, a, there's an alternate version that's more general uh, to, to be as Ekholm. But that requires uh, having multiple components and some sort of 
nice behavior. And it's essentially various ways that you can try to rig up so that you get rid of that bubbling phenomenon. Uh, but in general, I would say that there's, it's still fairly open. But for Legendre and knots, even uh, I mean, the case you've sketched out so far already is a complete knot invariant, right? So what more information do you get from allowing multiple? Uh, ah, that's an excellent question. So that's something I'll try to address in the third lecture. And this is that you, by considering more general holomorphic curves, you can actually get some sort of uh, grimoff witten potentials that, that will be related to uh, E modules and topological strings. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.